Hi folks, this is Pastor Vic, and I've got some good news for you. We're going to have a concert on August 16th at 6 o'clock in the evening. That's a Sunday, coming right up, just a couple of weeks away, actually a week and a half from today. And we hope that you plan to be with us uh, for the, our praise team, uh, singing their songs, everyone able to uh, drive in and, and enjoy from uh, either your cars with the windows rolled down, or if you want to get out of the car and bring your own lawn chairs and sit the, set them in front of the cars so that you can listen that way. Uh, in, in those ways, we, we maintain some of our necessary social distancing uh, and still be able to sing. So that's why we want to do this. It's, that's a, a week from this Sunday. Uh, that'll be the 16th of August. Let me show you where it will actually occur. Just follow me. I'm going out through Disciple Hall now. We're going out the uh, smaller narthex of our church. And it's going to be right outside these doors. This is Disciple Hall where we have all the pictures of the disciples. And this is where uh, the concert will take place on the 16th. The uh, concert is going to be with our praise team. There's an airplane going over right now. Uh, I'm sure you're hearing that Coast Guard uh, search plane. Uh, Anyway, it's going to be right out here. Look, right out here. We're going to have uh, just an ample spot for cars to come and to be uh, at least 10 feet uh, apart from each other, the different family units and their cars. The stage will be set up right over here at the corner of the education wing, right over here. And that's where the praise team will put on the concert. It's going to be at 6 o'clock on the 16th. Uh, there's no admission charge. We just want you to come and be a part of things. This is in preparation for a, an outside drive-in contemporary worship service that we will, we will begin on the 30th of August. And you'll hear more about that as time goes on. But I wanted you to be uh, aware of uh, on the 16th of August, this concert, 6 o'clock. Come and just be a part of this. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. Bye-bye. Good morning. I'm Corey, the youth director here at Englewood United Methodist Church. And I want to spend our time today focused on Romans 11.29, which says, For God's gifts and His call can never be withdrawn. It was late in the fall and a man was on an afternoon hike in the mountains, several miles from where he parked his vehicle. The temperature dropped quickly, and dark clouds began to form. Realizing a storm was approaching, the man headed back to where he left his car. But on the way, he was caught in a whiteout snowstorm. The hours passed. As he wandered in circles, unable to see even two feet ahead of him, he felt his energy giving out. Yet he knew that if he listened to his body and sat down to rest, he would never get up again. So after wandering around for a few more minutes, he finally gave in and decided it was time to rest, knowing he would soon die. But as he sat down, he felt something next to him. He brushed the snow away and found the body of someone who, like him, had been caught in the storm. He felt for a pulse. And finding there was still life flowing through the body, he stood up and with superhuman strength, hoisted the body to his shoulders and began to walk. After just 100 feet, he came to the door of a cabin. A cabin was only 100 feet away from where the hiker was ready to give up. He didn't see it because of the blizzard, but once he attempted to save someone else and started moving, the cabin materialized before him. Inside, there was a fire in the fireplace and a man was cooking dinner. Both of the travelers were warmed, fed, and saved. Maybe you feel like giving up, as though you want to sit down and die. The key for us is to look for someone who's worse off than you in order that you may give 
out of the gifts God has given you. I agree, some may say, but you don't know where I've been. Certainly the call to share in ministry is no longer on my life. I've sinned too badly that surely any gifts the Lord may have given me have been taken away from me. The problem of sinfulness. Are you more sinful than Samson? You know the story. He fell in love with a lady who had lips of honey and a heart full of poison. Oh, please, Sammy, she said. Tell me the secret of your strength. Well, babe, I'll tell you, Samson answered. If you put bowstrings of raw leather around me, I'll be as weak as any other man. So when Samson fell asleep, Delilah tied him up with leather strings and called for the Philistines, then yelled, Samson, wake up. The Philistines are here. Samson stood up, snapped the bowstrings off, and did the Philistines in. When the dust settled, Delilah looked at him and said, you lied to me. Forgive me, apologize, Samson. I'll tell you what, put green ropes around me and I'll be like any other individual. When Samson fell asleep again, Delilah did just that. Sammy, the Philistines are here again, she said. Just as he did before, Samson woke up, popped the ropes off, just like they were threads, and took on the Philistines. You lied to me, cried Delilah. Okay, okay, said Samson. If you weave my hair, I'll be like any other man. He fell asleep, and you know the story. He woke up with his hair woven, the Philistines were upon him, and he did them in. You gotta wonder about Samson. What's the deal? Could anyone be that dumb? But Delilah continued to cry day after day until finally he said, okay, I'll tell you the secret of my strength. If you cut my hair, I'll be like any other man. He fell asleep once more and she cut his hair. Samson, the Philistines are here, she cried. And Judges 16, 20 tells what happened next in one of the saddest verses in scripture. When he woke up, he thought, I'll do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him, gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze change and forced to grind grain in the prison. The question that comes to my mind is, was Samson really that stupid? I think that Samson knew he was going to get a haircut when he told Delilah his secret. We know from number six that as a Nazarite, Samson was absolutely forbidden to drink wine, touch dead bodies, or cut his hair. Yet Samson had taken wine at the Philistine parties and nothing had happened. He touched the dead body of a lion in which there was honey, and again, nothing happened. So I think that what Samson was really thinking was, well, I've already drunk wine. I've already touched a dead body. Nothing's going to happen to me if I cut my hair. Samson thought he was an exception. But he wasn't, and neither are you. Maybe you haven't felt the repercussion of your rebellion. But know this, if you continue down that road, you'll find some real trouble. Today is the day for you to stop trying the mercy and testing the patience of God. Back to Samson. His hair began to grow in Judges 16, 22. And when he was brought into the temple of Dagon, he prayed, Lord, Use me one more time. After requesting his captors to stand him between two supporting pillars, Samson stretched out his arms and pushed and literally brought the house down. Literally, 3,000 people in the balconies crashed to their deaths. And scripture records he killed more enemies of Israel in his death than he did in his life. Truly, the gifts and callings of of God can never be withdrawn. Maybe you feel your experience has been somewhat hairy. Know this, 
if, like Samson, you're willing to die to self and say, Lord, use me. I'm tired of living for myself, focused on myself, concerned about myself. Just use me. You too will bring the house down because the callings and giftings of God can never be withdrawn. The problem with rebelliousness, you might say, I agree that the Lord could use a sinful person like Samson so that his grace and mercy are seen all the more clearly. But me? I've already failed in what he's asked of me. How could he ask me again? Go to Nineveh, God said. Instead, Jonah went to Tarshish. The exact opposite direction. In route, a storm comes up, and you know the story. He was swallowed by a great fish. He's in a tight spot. A tight spot that stunk and was hot. And he probably felt a lot like he was in hell. Maybe you feel that way. Perhaps God called you to do something for him. He gifted and equipped you to carry out a specific task for the kingdom. But like Jonah, you chose to go in the opposite direction. And now you find yourself saying, I don't know where I'm going. Nothing's happening. I can't think straight. No wonder the Lord has given up on me. Listen, the Lord didn't give up on Jonah. All the time Jonah thought that he was going nowhere, in the dark, hot, smelly fish belly, the fish was moving in the right direction. Why? Because the gifts and calling of God can never be withdrawn. And once Jonah said, I'm sorry, the fish puked him up on the beach, messy hair, tattered clothes, stinking something horrible. But at last, he was in Nineveh, right where God wanted him right where God wanted him all along. He walked into the city looking and smelling bad, saying, repent, in 40 days judgment will come. The Ninevites saw him, they smelled him, they couldn't believe what they heard about him. Yet scripture records that the entire city repented. The greatest revival in world history came by way of a man who previously thought he was going nowhere because of his rebellion. So too, even though you feel like you don't deserve it, God's not through with you because the calling and gifting of God can never be withdrawn. He doesn't take them back. The problem with cowardice, I don't know him, swore Peter, why? Because a little girl said to him, I think I recognize you. Aren't you one of his followers? That was from Matthew 26, 71. I can't continue on in ministry, Peter said. I know Jesus is alive, but I've been such a coward. I've failed miserably. I'm going back to fishing. So it was that after fishing all night with his buddies, he heard a voice calling. Caught anything, children? Nothing, he yelled back. It's true. When you feel like you failed so badly that you just have to go back to fishing, back to old places, back to old the old gang, back to the old stuff, you always end up empty-handed. Put your net on the right side of the boat called the voice from the shore. And when Peter and the others did, they pulled in such a haul, it almost sank their boat. It's the Lord, they said at last. And when they reached the shore, what did they find? Fish roasting on the fire. You see, the very thing Peter went to see to find was in the hand of Jesus all along. Do you love me? He asked Peter three times in John 21, 15 through 17. He didn't say, Peter, if you love me, you're on probation. Prove yourself for three more years, and if you do well, we might allow you to hang out with us again. No, he said, Peter, if you even like me, then feed my sheep and tend my lambs. Go back to where you were before you went on this fishing trip. Get going again. And that's what the Lord says to you, 
who have felt as though you've chickened out in cowardice, to you who have dabbled in sinfulness, to you who have fled in rebelliousness. Keep going again. Feed my flock. Feed my flock. Do what you were doing before your excursion into sin. Get back to it once again. Gang, the, only the Lord shows that kind of grace. People don't. Churches often don't. But Jesus does. Follow me, he says, because my gifts and callings can never be withdrawn. Get going. And you'll find satisfaction in your heart, fulfillment in your life, and reward for eternity. Don't waste any more time. Your hair is growing. The fish is moving. The fish aren't biting. So get going. Will you pray with me? Lord God, you have blessed each of us richly with gifts and a calling upon our lives. We know that we have failed you through our sinful sinfulness, through our rebelliousness, and through our cowardice. Help us to be like Samson and Jonah and Peter, to turn back to you when we stray, to trust in you and the gifts and the callings that can never be withdrawn, to get going and move forward in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great, great day.